This is the solutions and discussion for exercise three, transferring and sharing data. In this exercise, our scenario is that we want to copy some code from our own machine to a home directory on Jasmine and copy some data to a group workspace so that we can share it with colleagues. Um, and it assumes that you belong to the workshop group workspace. Our objectives are listed here. Let's just recap. By the end of this exercise, I'll be able to copy a small text file from my local machine to my Jasmine home directory using a transfer server, copy a directory tree of data files recursively from my local machine to the workshop group workspace, understand permissions and ownership needed for group access, be aware of the limitations of some transfer methods, and pull in data from an external data source using a transfer server. Just briefly to recap the task, um, we're going to make a simple text file, copy it to your home directory, then make a directory on your local machine, make some simple files in it, that's the source directory, make a destination directory for that within the group work workshop group workspace, copy the source directory and its contents to the destination directory using a transfer server, then we're going to check that the ownership and permissions are as we would like, and we're going to use um, some command line tools to download a test file of uh, say 100 megabytes to your destination directory in the group workshop group workspace, then it can be deleted. So let's have a look at how we'd actually do that. So I've got a terminal here on my um, own machine and the first thing I'm going to do is uh, create a small text file just using the echo command, so echo some text into that file. And it's that file that I'm going to SCP to the remote machine, so my SCP command is um, just SCP, the name of the file, my username at x41.jasmine, and the path at the end there is just tilde slash, meaning my home directory, and there we go, that's copied um, fairly promptly. If I log in to this other terminal window, using this other terminal window here, log in to x um, just to see uh, where that file's ended up, so I can go into my home directory, just check where I am, again using pwd. So I'm in my home directory and I can do ls-l on the readme file um, just to check that it's there. Um, so that's obviously worked. So the next thing to do would be to make um, a small tree of uh, files. So I've got two directories that I've made here with the mkdir command minus p just means make the directories if they don't exist and all the directories in that path as well. Um, and then I'm going to echo some text into uh, file01.txt in the 01 directory and some different text into file02.txt in the um, uh, 02 directory. I can use the find command just to uh, check on what I've actually made. And then we can go back to the other terminal here, and navigate to our destination directory where we can check on what's been copied over. So if we do find first of all we can just see the structure uh, but if I do ls minus l capital R for recursive that shows me uh, the files that have been copied over and their permissions. Um, they're probably uh, correct, uh, they may well be, but let's lock them down for now, let's restrict them and then we'll gradually open, up, open them up to uh, the people we want to share our data with. So if we look at the uh, output of ls minus lr again, we can see that the effect of that command has been to re remove the uh, group and world permissions from uh, those files and directories. If we look at the O1 directory, for example, we've got drwx. Um, the rwx refers to the user, and then there's six dashes after that, three for each of um, group and world, and those are currently unset, so they don't have permission to read those files. Uh, what we might want to do is now uh, open up the permissions on the mydata01 directory with this command here. So we're doing change mod, minus r recursive, g plus rx, so we're giving group read permission to the files and directories um, as we can see here, and if we do ls minus lr again, we can see the effect is to add the read permission to the work to the group um, set of permissions uh, for 
the O1 directory, but also the file o1.txt, which is in that directory. If you remember, we use the minus capital R option with chmod, which applies the changes recursively. You can also change the um, permissions on files or directories individually, but bear in mind that they're also affected by um, any direct the permissions on any directories um, above them in the path. Note that the group ownership of a file or directory in a group workspace might be different from other files you've created, for example in your home directory. If we look at the permissions on the readme text file that you wrote earlier, um, we can see that that file actually belongs to a different group, users, and that's the default group that all members of uh, Jasmine Login belong to. You can check what groups you belong to with the groups command. So here, uh, this user belongs to users, open, and this particular group workspace has its own group called gws underscore workshop. And it's that group workspace specific group that enables uh, group workspace managers or users of a group workspace to set permissions um, as they want them to share the data or not share the data with other users as they wish. If you do have some files or directories that belong to the wrong group, um, you can change which group they belong to using the chgrp command like this recursively if you want, and uh, that will enable you to um, share them with the right group. You do need to have permission to modify the files to be able to make that change though. So if we check back against our task outline here, we can see that we've completed items 1 to 6. Um, where we've been using a transfer server to do some basic copy operations and looking at how to make the permissions uh, do what we want. So we can now look at how to download a test file from uh, an external source. In this case, we've got a 100 megabyte file on a test server. Speedtest.tele2.net is a site that's, um, that hosts a bunch of uh, files of different sizes for the purposes of performance testing. So we can use the tool wget which is available on the transfer servers. So it's just wget and the URL, and that will pull that file in. And we get some interesting information telling us that it's managed to do it at, I think it's 142 megabytes a second. That's pretty good. Um, this is on one of the standard transfer VMs. And once we've downloaded that file, it's 100 megabytes. Um, so if we don't need it, we may as well delete it. An alternative is to write to the null device or dev null which means that it's not actually written to the storage. Um, we can look at the transfer rate again here, which is pretty good. All sorts of factors can contribute to slow transfer performance, but um, writing to devnull can be useful to try and eliminate uh, this particular um, uh, storage or this particular machine as, as the bottleneck. And quite often the reason is a slow server at the other end or complex directory structures full of small files. Um, the act of writing to the storage and creating uh, a very large and complex tree of uh, files and directories uh, slows performance down significantly. Um, for more discussion of transfer performance and advanced data transfer, um, we've got another exercise um, in the workshop. The equivalent using the curl command would be shown here. Um, so we've got curl minus O uh, dev null specifying the output and then the URL. Um, and both wget and curl are quite useful feature rich tools they can do a lot more than shown here um, so if you have a look at the relevant man pages man is just a system for documentation on linux and unix so if you do man wget or man curl um, you can have a look at the uh, documentation there so just reviewing where we are again we've looked at how to copy small files such as source code or scripts to your home directory how to copy data to a group workspace how to check permissions on the data to make sure it's visible by collaborators, and how to download some data from an external data source. Using methods which are suitable for small data sets where speed is not so critical. For larger data transfers over longer distances, um, other options could be more efficient. As I say, we've got a later exercise covering some of that. But we can talk about some of the alternatives and best practice um, in a discussion just now. So in addition to SCP, which we used in this example, um, other alternatives are SFTP, uh, Secure FTP, and RSync, uh, which are all members of the same family, if you like. They all use the SSH protocol, um, and they enable simple data transfer. So RSync in particular is quite good because it can synchronize a local and remote directory. 
and can be configured to copy only those data that are new or have changed. So that's um, efficient if you're running it repeatedly. SFTP is very useful and is also uh, supported by many third party tools. Um, R clone is a relatively new tool and talks to lots of different, uh, particularly cloud storage backends, but also um, SFTP servers. So you could configure R clone to talk to uh, the Jasmine uh, transfer servers or use it to move data between uh, Jasmine and say Amazon S3, that kind of thing. So some of those third party tools, uh, as I say, provide graphical interfaces for doing transfers. So for example, FileZilla and Cyberduck are two of these. Also, a growing number of uh, things like editors actually include extensions now which allow you to set up SSH or SFTP connections. So effectively, you can edit and save files remotely. Um, so this can be useful for editing files on Jasmine, um, but from the convenience of your own desktop, desktop environment on your local machine. But in fact, none of the um, SSH-based transfer methods we've looked at perform well for moving large volumes of data over large distances. Um, so large, we mean you know, multi-terabytes of data and long sort of international, intercontinental particularly. Um, so those kind of transfer tasks are covered in the advanced data transfers uh, exercise, uh, which is later in the workshop. So let's have a look now at the answers to some of the self-test questions. So the first one was about how to set the file permissions on a directory so that it can be A, written by another member of the same workspace. Um, and so the answer to that is, as well as checking the existing permissions and making sure that it belongs to the right group, you could then do um, chmod g plus rw, because that's adding the r and w permissions uh, to some, a member of the same group uh, to that file name. And B, uh, readable by any user of Jasmine. Um, we can do this with chmod O plus R and the file name, the O being the world permissions and uh, making it readable, adding the R permission. Um, but it's worth noting you should never do O plus RW. You should never make a file world writable. Um, that's not a safe thing to do. Second question, how could you share data on Jasmine with users outside of Jasmine? Well, there are two ways you can do this. Um, one is to ask your group workspace manager to request what we call HTTP data sharing uh, for your workspace. It's not enabled by default, but it's something that can be requested and the Jasmine team would need to set that up. Uh, so that would enable external users to be able to access data uh, like you did with the HTTP download using tools like wget or um, curl or through a web browser over HTTP. Another emerging alternative, although it's quite a new thing on Jasmine, is using object storage or high performance object store. So this is something again that you would need to talk to your uh, group workspace manager and they'd need to talk to the Jasmine team about uh, allocating some object storage, so storing your data on object store instead of uh, POSIX file system, and that allows for much more flexible uh, sharing options. Question three, uh, why are transfer methods based on SSH, not very efficient over long distances. Now this would have required a little bit of reading around, perhaps in the uh, Jasmine documentation about high performance data transfers. Um, essentially the software stack that these tools are built on um, has some limitations because of a buffer size that's limited and that prevents them from making full use of the available bandwidth, um, even over high bandwidth connections and particularly over long distances where the, there's a, a network latency or delay, if you like. Um, there are tools that are able to cope with that environment much better, and those tools are uh, the ones that we recommend. Um, those recommendations are based on this group called ESNet in the, in the US, who are experts on high-performance data transfer, um, particularly for research networks. And uh, there's a couple of links there if you're interested. Um, but as I say, the uh, Jasmine data transfer zone is actually uh, built on a blueprint that um, ESNet uh, recommend as their best practice. So if we check back against the objectives for exercise three, we can see we've covered most of what we set out to do. Um, so uh, the links you can see on the final page here uh, should give you any pointers to any further information you might need.